Uh, yeah, I'm Tadeu. I work on JavaScript for Apple. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about the intersection between JavaScript and WebAssembly from an implementation perspective, uh, not just from using those languages. Uh, they might seem super different uh, from just, you know, your characteristics when you're using them, completely different use cases. But I was pretty surprised about how much was actually shared when, when implemented it. So just for some context, JavaScript Core is the JavaScript virtual machine that ships with WebKit. And WebKit is a browser engine that's used by Safari among other browsers. Uh, you might also have heard about JavaScript Core since it's used by third-party apps to run JavaScript on iOS. Uh, so you know, if you're writing a React Native app, the odds are you're using JavaScript Core as well. But first of all, what actually is a VM or a, sorry, a virtual machine and, or VM for short? Uh, by definition, it's just a piece of software that gives you an abstraction that lets you not worry about the underlying operating system or hardware when you run your program. And what that gives you is the ability to just write your code in a higher level language like JavaScript. And then as long as the, the machine you're targeting can run a JavaScript VM, you can just run there without having to add support for new processors or, or operating systems. So that's conceptually what it is, but what it is actually made of. We, if we just wanted to build a very simple VM, we could start with these like little, uh, four little components. So basically a lecture, a parser, an interpreter, and a runtime. Uh, if you're not familiar with all of them, don't worry, we'll kind of have a quick look right now. So here we're talking about JavaScript. So we start with these, uh, string representation of the program. Since JavaScript is a source-based language, we just get the text. And the first thing we do is we feed it into the lexer. Uh, the lexer is also sometimes called a tokenizer because its job is just to take this string and break it into tokens. Uh, tokens are the smallest lexical unit that we care about. So for instance, for this uh, small program, the tokens could be just you know the function keyword, the add identifier, the parentheses, and therefore, so basically, instead of looking at each character, we break into these small things that is actually what we care about. Once we have our tokens, we feed that into the parser. And the parser's job is to look at that and build the abstract syntax tree, or ESD for short. And as the name suggests, the ESD is just a tree representation for a program. So the parser would go and see like, well, I see a function keyword. So next, I should have the name of the function. And after that, I should see the, the opening parentheses so I can have the function parameters and therefore. So here we can see at the top level, we have our function node for, for the function declaration. Every The only thing we have inside the function board is a return statement. The value being returned is the addition of two identifiers. So here, usually we would have some metadata for each of these nodes. Like we might want to know that the name of the function is add and that the left identifier is called x and the right one is called y. I just left it out so it would fit here. But hopefully you get the idea. Now we, we want to actually run our program. And there's quite a few ways we can go about that, but the simplest way of implementing it would just to take this AST and feed it straight into the interpreter. And that's unsurprisingly called an AST interpreter. Now, if you wanted to write this AST interpreter just for the, for the little AST that we just saw, uh, the main piece of code we would have to write is just these four functions. So one to run each of the nodes we had, right? The function node, the return, the addition, and then the identifiers. If you wanted to look at how we would write one of those, the addition, for instance, uh, it's pretty in intuitive, hopefully. Like it, the result of the addition is just you run the left-hand side, uh, the left, and then you run the right-hand side and you add them together. Here, the only thing is we didn't really implement this run function yet, but the idea is that it takes any kind of node and then just calls the appropriate function. So it's just a function that's going to switch on what kind of node you get and then either call run function or run identifier or run addition and therefore. But the really tricky part here is actually just this plus operator. So now we're looking at some JavaScript code and hypothetically implementing a JavaScript VM. In that case, when the language you're implementing is the same as one the one you're writing on, it's easy because, well, it's already JavaScript, so the plus will do the right thing. It's also not very helpful, right? You, most people don't write JavaScript VMs in JavaScript. So in JavaScript 4, for instance, it's written in C++, and we can't just use the plus operator. So what you have to do in that case is you go to the spec, and you see 
what does it say about how do you run that, right? So we see here, uh, runtime semantics, evaluation, and then we see what are the steps you have to take to implement this plus operator or the addition operator so that it, it behaves according to the spec. So here it just calls this one function. If you go into that function, there's five steps. You have to get the values and then we call another function. And here we have multiple steps with many sub steps. So it's actually tricky to get all your operations to just respect all the semantics described in the spec. And the way we usually go about that is that instead of just having that plus, we call and we implement a function that will implement addition according to the proper, uh, with the proper semantics, sorry. That function will easily leave in the runtime. So the runtime has everything that we need to support the interpreter while we're running the program. That might include things like uh, language, uh, language support, or that will have all the, these operations with the right semantics, memory management. So we're talking like a garbage collector, allocator, all those things. Uh, it might have things like the bug, the bugging support, and you know, pretty much anything that you need to support the interpreter. And these are just a few examples. Now, even though this is the most straightforward of implementing an interpreter, it's not the most effective one since we have this AST and we have to recursively go down the tree and it's a little bit expensive. And don't get me wrong, like the first, the, the VMs at first, like JavaScript VMs in the early days that shipped with browsers, some of them were written like that. But as the JavaScript applications got more complex, the VMs also had to evolve to run faster. Uh, one of the ways we can actually improve these these interpreters by making it into a bytecode interpreter. And the idea here is that instead of just feeding the AST straight into the interpreter, we add a new box here, which we might call a bytecode generator. Some people might call it a bytecode compiler. It's your pick. It's the same thing, really. So the, the idea of the generator is that we move some of the code that would be done once we're running our function to run early on while we're generating the bytecode. So we take this AST and we generate this bytecode, which is just a lower level representation of the program. So for instance, the bytecode for JavaScript 4 might look something like this. So we have the enter opcode, which basically just set things up to start executing your program. Then we have the actual addition, and then we just return the result. And if you look at the core of the bytecode interpreter, what it will usually have is just a loop that goes through all these bytecodes and executes them one by one. So this is just straight line code. And then for each of these bytecodes, it will have to kind of check what's the type. So this is the run function similar to what we talked about, right? So it will check the bytecode type that's also sometimes called the opcode. So here we could call enters an opcode, add is another opcode and reads another one. And then we'll just call the appropriate piece of code for that, that bytecode that we're looking at right now. This piece of code is often called the interpreter dispatch. And it's the, one of the most expensive parts of an interpreter because each, of, each bytecode in its own doesn't do much. This piece of code just runs so many times that it really adds up. And if, if you look at a production VM, there's, there's definitely a way of speeding this up. The interpreter dispatch might not just look like switch like we just saw. But fundamentally, as long as we have an interpreter, there's no way of, of getting rid of the interpreter dispatch. The only way to completely get rid of it is by compiling instead of interpreting the code. And that's where just-in-time or JIT compilers came in. So if we go back to our VM diagram, we can just bolt a JIT right into it. And the idea here is that the interpreter runs your code and at some point it might just decide that it wants to compile it instead. So it talks to the JIT and asks it to generate machine code for your function. That machine code, once it's running, it's also gonna to talk to the runtime to perform all the operations like we just saw with the interpreter, basically the same idea. And uh, it's the fun thing about it is that if we look at the core again for the JIT compiler, how it decides what code to generate, it will look a lot like the interpreter dispatch we just saw. But similar with the bytecode generator, what we do is that we take these code and we run it later on, only once. So we run this, which is equivalent to the interpreter dispatch once, compile the function. Now, every time you call that function, we don't have that interpreter dispatch anymore because we just generated machine code for it, which is, it's consecutive, it's just straight line without any dispatching. Now, if we wanted to look at about at how this compile, one of these functions might look like, let's look at the addition again. So the idea here is that 
you might have some helpers, right? Most of the JIT compilers will support multiple platforms. So you have some level of abstraction. So here we're basically just loading the, the left hand operator in some register. Then we load the right hand register in another, uh, the right hand operand, sorry, into another registers. And then we just call out to this runtime function called JS add, the same function from before. Now, these will work. I mean, of course, these will have to be a C function and, and therefore, but the general idea should work. The only problem is that this is very expensive. So let's just uh, kind of take a detour here and just pretend with me for a second that we're actually compiling C++ code. Now you would be we would be forced to, when declaring that function, specify which types we are compiling, right? So you can't just say that it takes any X and any Y, you have to give it the type. Here, just for, for the sake of the argument, I just made everything an integer. And now if we compile this function with Clang or GCC, you get something that looks a lot like this. So basically we get a symbol, every function gets a symbol, and then we get a prologue and an epilogue, and every function is gonna have that. And then we get the actual instruction that does the addition, and that's a single instruction compared to our, just compared to our call into the runtime, that's gonna have like several instructions. It's so much slower. And here, all we have is this instruction that's uh, actually called load effective address. Uh, that's on x86, not my fault that they decide to use that instruction for that. But hopefully you get the idea, right? Instead of having these called, it's super expensive. If we knew that all our function would do is just add integers, you could replace that with the single instruction and be done with it. And that would be much better. And that's where speculative optimizations come into play. So again, if you go back to our VM diagram, that's usually gonna be added there in the form of an optimizing compiler or an optimizing JIT. And again, the idea is that you go from the interpreter to the JIT and from the JIT, you might decide you want to optimize your code. So you call it to your, your optimizing JIT. So let's see how that might actually look in practice. So first we have to actually call our function, right? Before all we had was just a function declaration, not, nothing would happen. But here let's just add a for loop it's just gonna call that function a million times with two integers. One is i ranging from zero to a million minus one and the other one's just a number seven. It really doesn't matter here. So at, at the bottom here, we have something that's like a call graph over time. So at the bottom, at, at the first, we have uh, our root code, which is the, just a global code. So that will be creating that function, adding it to the scope, initializing the variables, that kind of thing. And eventually we will start calling these other function many times, right? First, we start with the interpreter. Now, at some point, let's say when i is 100, the, the VM might just stop the program and say like, wait, like this function is running too much. It might be worth taking some time to compile it. So that's actually gonna run faster every time we call it. And at that point, we're gonna switch and start executing that function in the JIT. So the JIT compiled code for that function. Now, as we carry on executing it more and more, when we get to a later point, let's say when i is now 1000, the VM might stop it again and say like, wait, this is for real, right? This function is gonna be, called, it's being called a lot. What's the best we can do here? And now the idea is that we look back to see what our program has done so far. And based on that, we spec on how the program is gonna behave in the future. So here, for instance, the compiler can see that that function add was only ever called with integers. And what the compiler can do is effectively just add those annotations there. And now we have something that looks a lot more like, like our C program instead of our, our JavaScript program. And that allows us to get code that looks a lot more like the code we get from the C compiler than the code we would get from the JavaScript compiler. We don't quite get down to a single instruction, but we get much closer to that than, than to what we were originally. And now we'll just carry on and we'll execute this program to the end uh, with the optimized code. All right, so just a quick recap. Uh, this is what we started with, the simplest VM uh, we could have, just as few components as possible. And eventually we grew, uh, we grew into this one, which has a few more boxes. Uh, the, the first one was somewhat representative of a very like early days JavaScript VM. This is slightly closer to what we have today. Uh, but of course, in practice, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Like if we look at JavaScript 4, these are just the interpreters and compilers we have. So that's three interpreters, nine compilers, four for JavaScript, plus some special ones. We have uh, 
regular expression interpreter, regular expression JIT, CSS JIT. We will compile some DOM uh, calls and, and you know, as, as we just got to this point because the JavaScript applications kept getting more complex and, you know, the VM just has to, to follow and, and run these programs as fast as possible. Now for, for this talk, the most relevant ones right now are the four JavaScript tiers. So these are all uh, JavaScript execution tiers. All these tiers can run uh, your, your JavaScript code, not, not just a specialized part of it, but your whole program. And we like to think of these tiers in this scale uh, that trade uh, progressively trades latency for throughput. So here, for instance, we start on the left uh, from the linked, which is the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter has the lowest latency, which means that it just starts as soon as possible, right? As soon as we have the bytecode, it can start running without any compilation step. It also has its lowest, uh, the, the lowest throughput. So it will have the interpreter dispatch, you know, it's not compiled code. Uh, there's no optimizations that we can apply while generating the code because, well, we don't generate code. As soon as your function runs more, we go to the right to the baseline JIT, which is would be our known optimizing JIT. Again, it takes a little bit longer to compile, but it does run about twice as fast as the interpreter. And then eventually we might make it our, make our way to the right to the DFG, which stands for data flow graph, that we already do several optimizations and run much faster than the baseline. And eventually, if we keep going, we'll make it to the FTL, which will generate the best code, but it's also going to take the longest to compile. And the reason for that is the FTL has most of the optimizations that you would see in something like a traditional C compiler. Uh, so it will go all the way there to, to try and use all these speculations and generate code that's as fast as possible. Now that was kind of the state of the VM when WebAssembly came along, right? And now we have to run this language that's completely different, statically type, has a binary format instead of being text, and, and it might look like we'll have to build an entirely new VM just for it. But like I, I said at the beginning, I was super surprised of how much it was reused. And the reason for that is that if we look at our compiler, we're just talking about the FTL. That the FTL is able to do a lot of the optimizations that a C compiler would do. And WebAssembly has as much type information as C. So maybe you can just reuse that. So now if you look at how the FTL is uh, inside, so the idea here is that we take some bytecode and we run it. So the FTL will reuse all of the DFG front end, which is also pretty cool. So the DFG has its own intermediate representation, or we usually call it an IR, which is lower level than the bytecode. So the, the, the idea here is that we were progressively going lower level until we catch machine code. So we get to the DFG front end, we get our intermediate representation, we run to the optimizer that will have several optimization passes. So uh, common sub expression elimination, constant folding, loop invariant code motion, deck elimination, and 68 more phases. So 72 in total, that's gonna run for a while. And then we get the, the optimized IR out of that and then we feed it into FTL loading. So this is where we go FTL specific. And then we have yet another IR called B3 IR. B3 is our backend, which operates at a level similar to LLVM, you might say. Uh, so B3 stands for bare bones backend. And here you might see that it will do some of the optimizations that were already done at the DFG level. It will do it again. Uh, it will do CS, uh, common sub expression elimination again, then code elimination again, but also has some new optimization that we, that we didn't see in the DFG, like data duplication. So the idea is that when we go to a lower level IR, we might see new op opportunities to run the same optimizations again. Now we get our optimized B2IR and we feed it into the instruction selector. selector sorry. And here is where we start getting uh, code that's specific to the machine we're gonna run on. Right? So we already chose the instructions, the, the CPU instructions for our code. So for instance, if we're targeting x86 and you're adding two numbers, the, my, the best option might not be to use the add instruction, but the load effective address instruction like we just saw. And what we get out of that is, our, is what we call AIR, uh, which is, stands for assembly IR. Then we have another optimizer for air, and then eventually it makes its way to the register allocator. And finally, we get some machine code of, out of it. Now, when we first added support for WebAssembly, we did so with two execution tiers, BBQ, which is uh, built by code quickly, which is a less optimizing jet, and the OMG, which 
stands for optimized machine code generator, of course. Uh, and it's a full optimizing jet. So what does that actually mean? So this is what we had with the FTL. And in order to reuse it, what we did is we replaced that FTL lowering box with the with the a new front end for WebAssembly. So basically what this front end does, it takes WebAssembly bytecode as an input and it, it generates B3 IR. And also really cool is that this front end is used or was used at first uh, by both tiers, BBQ and OMG. The only difference here being that BBQ would call into this front end with dash O zero, which means uh, don't run any optimizations that are optional. Some of the optimization might still have to run, but it would just avoid as, as much as possible so we can get machine code as fast as possible. Now the OMG would call with dash O2 just means like go for it, like make this code as fast as possible. And that's why one was less optimizing the other one was a full optimizing JIT. Now that worked pretty well. The only issue was that if we look at our latency to put a trade-off uh, scale, both of these tiers are in the very far right because they're both put on top of the FTL, which was you know in, the, in our JavaScript scale, the rightmost tier. Now, in order to improve this, what we did was we added a new front end, which instead of generating B3IR, would go straight into air. So by going straight into a lower level IR, we skip many of these phases. In fact, we even pass straight through the air optimizer, and that gets us, that gets us to machine code quicker. And in practice, what actually happens is that we're just taking this tier and shifting it to the left. Sorry, I skipped straight to. So yeah, we're taking this tier and, and kind of pulling it back to the left. So now we have a little bit more to trade off, a little bit more uh, latency throughput trade off that we can work with. Now there's still like this pretty big gap on the left. And, and if we look at our JavaScript latency throughput trade off, we already know one way at least that we can fill that gap, which is by using an interpreter. And that's, a, that's actually what we did. So we created a new WebAssembly interpreter for JavaScript core. And the reason that worked well for us is that we have we already have a pretty good infrastructure for our interpreter. So we already know how to generate bytecode that's as compact as possible. We have a pretty cool uh, DSL, which is a domain specific language that allows us to just very easily add new bytecodes into the interpreter. So here, for instance, the select, uh, the select bytecode for WebAssembly. That's how you go about declaring it. So basically just give it a name and say what kind of arguments you have. You give it types and that's gonna generate a fully typed C++ struct. That's gonna give you all the code to emit that bytecode in the bytecode generator. That's gonna give the code to pre-print it and many other functionalities. It also gives you a convenient way of declaring multiple opcodes that just behave the same way. Like if we look at web assemblies, you have all these different size stores and the only difference is, uh, you know, actually how many bytes you're storing, but they kind of look like the same. This gives you a convenient way of declaring that. We also have our own portable assembly language, which we call the offline ASM, and it's super convenient. So for instance, it gives you uh, some registers that are not machine dependent. So you can talk about registers without, you know, talking about the register for a specific CPU you're targeting. It also has uh, its own instructions. So here we can see like branch test is zero. It's just gonna test whether the value in that register is zero. It has a super powerful macro system, which is pretty much just macros are just lambdas or, or closures, if you will. And in fact, most of the things you see here are just calls to macros. So for instance, this wasm op, you just call it, you give it the name of the opcode you're implementing and you give it a macro. And that's macro is gonna be called multiple times to generate different implementations of the same bytecode. And that's just done for free once you declare it using that macro. So it's a very powerful abstraction when you're working something as low level as assembly. Another super cool thing is uh, it gives you access to constants defined in C++ and uh, offsets of member variables and sizes of classes and all these things. So if, if you're usually doing that in assembly, you have to just, you know, do the math, figure out the number, put it in the air, and then hope that nobody changes the class and it doesn't get out of sync. But what offline asking gives us is just 
this abstraction where you can directly refer to the C++ types. So here, was select is a struct that was actually generated from uh, the previous slide when we declared it off select. And then all these M condition, M0 and 0 are instance variables or members, sorry, of that struct. And we can refer to it directly in C++ uh, from, from offline as well. And last but not least, it gives us the ability to just target multiple platforms. It supports ARMv7, ARM64, ARM64e, x86, x86, x86 4 MIPS. And if you still need to run in one platform that's not listed here, it also supports just compiling to C++ and then you can use a C++ compiler to target anything else. Now, this is what our WebAssembly pipeline looks like. And we, can, we have a lot better distribution in our latency throughput trade-off chart. And again, gives us the same leverage that we have in JavaScript where you can really choose in which tier you want to run depending on how much time you're willing to take to compile your code. And one thing that I personally found pretty funny is that if we look at JavaScript and WebAssembly side by side over time, in JavaScript, we started with an interpreter. And then eventually, as we felt the need to run the code faster, we just added tiers, so baseline and then an optimizing JIT, and then we still need it to go faster, so yet another optimizing JIT. Now in WebAssembly, the idea is just to run as fast as, or almost as fast, as close as possible to how fast machine code runs. So then we started from the most optimizing tier. You can imagine that PPT was there as well, but it was also built on top of the FTL, so it was pretty close to the right. And eventually we made our way to the left, with uh, the new BPQ tier, which is pretty close to baseline jet, and then eventually to, to the interpreter. And, you know, they both kind of ended up at similar places, but with very, uh, they, they took a completely opposite path here. And I was personally very amused by that. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. That's all I had for today. Thank you very much. What are WebAssembly's use cases and why would someone like me, a regular React developer, need to understand or use WebAssembly? So I think that the use case is more and more, I think there's, okay, two different use cases that I, I've personally seen. One is just reusing code, right? So you have these massive C++ code that you, know, you just want to run the browser and instead yeah. of just rewriting the whole thing, you can just, maybe not dropping the whole thing, but at least we use parts of your code base, kind of like what React Native does, right? It doesn't let you just take a React app and immediately run on mobile, but gives yep. you a way of sharing that code and, and reusing it. So it's not immediately free, just run everywhere, but gives you that power. And I think the second one is just small functionalities that you just need as much, as much speed as possible. Uh, but I, I think that the, the Point I was trying to make is that even though it started as this thing, like we wanted to run really fast, and one of the big use cases are games, right? You still yeah. don't want to just open your browser and then wait five minutes, go get a cup of coffee, and then come back and okay, it, it can run now. So even though we wanted to run fast, ideally for anything that's running on demand, like it's, it's still a JIT compiler, so it's going to take its time to compile. So you probably don't want it to just take forever to start and then run super fast. So we, we still want that curve where you can progressively choose uh, what parts of the code should run fast and what parts don't really need to. So there is a number which I don't remember, so I won't quote it, but a, a very big part of your program is only gonna run once and that's, uh, that's been checked before. So a lot of the code is just initializing things, setting things up and that code you really don't want to just waste all the time compiling for fastest optimizing compiler because you know you're going to run it once and then you're going to throw it away so so that's it, the idea yeah and it's also making um new technologies possible things i don't know if you've heard of blazer um but yeah. it's kind of an interesting way to write c sharp and then uh kind of i guess tra transpile it to uh javascript code or at least uh, be able to kind of build like a single page application and just not even have to write JavaScript at all. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, Swix had uh, a question and I'm just going to let him ask you. He can probably ask it better than I. Hey, sorry. Um, I'm back after <laughs> most of the He call. saw me struggling, so he came in. 
<laughs> no, it's just it's uh it's a lot to take in, especially for most of us JS devs who don't really deal uh, with this low level of of um, what the language does. Um, you know, I think Link Clark has also been doing a lot of advocacy around uh, WASM Link as well. And yep. I was I was always curious, like if if you have any opinion on like the state of WASI. WASI seems like a very interesting uh, sort of development in in the <coughs> web assembly and. Um, you know, basically, my question was, what is the state of WASI today, and is it a better, safer target for tooling uh, than than native for, um, than than you know for native binaries? So I'm not. So I personally, um, I, I don't do the best job of keeping up with everything that's happening. There's a, a lot of standards, and and we do have people on the team that go to to the WebAssembly uh, community meetings, and and people that go to TC39. I'll, I did that a few times, but I, I'm not regularly there. Um, I've seen Link's talk and uh, basically the context I have that I, I think it's pretty cool and it seems like a very good idea, but I'm not really up to date on what's what are the latest developments. But I, I really hope it's 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 going forward because you know it it looks like it looks great. And I think people are making very good progress on WebAssembly. It's just it's a big task, right? And it's uh, many people working together. So I think some things just take time to figure out what's what's the right way forward and, and get every getting everyone to to a consensus. And uh, how about language that require garbage collection like Go? Will it be supported natively with with WebAssembly in the future, or do they have to ship their own uh, garbage? So collection? that's yeah, that's probably like one of the hardest problems that WebAssembly has to solve, in my opinion. And there's been work done in that direction. So I, I know there's quite a few people working on that right now. And from my understanding is that they are taking an approach that's basically breaking it into steps. So they did reference types, uh, uh, references. So they're working on, on types. I think they're working on some uh, kind of like structured types. So basically all these things are just smaller pieces that eventually will help us get to, to, to a place where we can just reuse the, the, the GC from the host VM. And stupid question, uh, if we ever get garbage collection that you know, could run something like TypeScript directly on WebAssembly or, I mean, uh, compile it and, or? You would still have the challenge. I mean, you could, right? In the same way that we just compile JavaScript you could just yeah. compile TypeScript. But the thing there is that it's not, when you generate code for a dynamic language, you still have to handle all those cases, right? So the reason why JIT compilers are so powerful is that you have the ability of just making these speculations like they talked about. <clears throat> so you look at some code and say like, well, guess what? I think this is only ever gonna see integers and you say that. And it's, I mean, ideally you want to be right, but if you're wrong, it's not the end of the world, right? Because it's a JIT compiler, you have the power of just going back. So let's say for that function, I, I should like have an add function, you just speculate it's only ever gonna see integers. And then out of nowhere, someone decides to use your function to concatenate two strings. And now what the JIT compiler is gonna do is that it's gonna have a check here. It's gonna say like, oh wait, uh, this is not what I was expecting. Then it's gonna roll back and it's gonna either run in the interpreter or, or in the code that knows how to handle strings. So you can have this version of the code that's okay, not handling all the cases. As long as it's right most of the time, you're gonna run faster. And that's the idea. But now if you're compiling something ahead of time to WebAssembly and you, you just ship your function, right? To, to, the, to your user. And then you say, well, this function is only ever gonna add integers. And then someone checked in some code that's using your function to concatenate two strings and you didn't realize, now that function is just gonna crash. Uh, so hopefully okay. you get the idea, right? Like you compile something ahead of time that doesn't mm -hmm. actually have the power to handle the program. And, and mm. that's a problem. All right. Any any resources that you think are, are really good um, for trying to learn more about um, WASM? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I personally find the spec pretty readable. I that's probably not most people just go to. <laughs> like, I want to learn about what and pop up the spec and, and have a read. Um, I know that if you want to get just a general understanding, I think Lynn's talks are just fantastic at that. Like, yeah, her code starting. <clears throat> and, 
if you just, want to dive into the deep end, I think the spec is not unmanageable. Just read the manual, uh, Eric. <laughs> I'll start with Lynn's yeah. talk. How about that? <laughs> There's got to be RTFM in the middle. But... Yeah. All, All right. right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tadio. This was great. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Tadio. It's great. Well, thank you for having me. I'll, I'll thanks for coming. Bye -bye. See you.